Now, with online marketplaces, super apps and other digital platforms continuing their very fast growth and uh, aggregate uh, both, uh, and the ones that aggregate both commerce and community activities, you've got to ask what impact might they have on banking and payments? It's an obvious question, isn't it? Partnerships are now data led and API enabled. So, James Lloyd, Asia Pacific FinTech and payment leader at EY Parthenon, will moderate a panel consisting of Liz Oaks, Executive Vice President of Strategy and Operations Excellence at Mastercard. That's an amazing title. Uh, Janet Young, Managing Director, Head of Group Channels and Digitalization of United Overseas Bank, UOB. And Joel Yarborough, Vice President of Asia Pacific for Rapid. If you'd like to post questions to the panel, which you can, click on the yellow button. It is beneath the session window. But let's, if we can, go over to James to kick off the conversation. Great. Well, well, thank you very much uh, for that fantastic introduction. Um, I think we will be challenged to do as good a one ourselves, but but let me try. Um, firstly, kind of good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I am sitting in my home office in Hong Kong. Uh, I have put my four young children to bed in the past 30 minutes, and my wife is next door at a neighbor's house. So if any children come through the door at any point, uh, I may need to attend to that. But in the meantime, um, we've got a fantastic panel. Uh, I have to say building open ecosystems is, is one of those topics that means many things to many people. Um, but I do genuinely believe we've got a, a very interesting uh, and lively debate to come. Uh, I won't try to introduce my panelists themselves. I'm going to ask them to do that because I think, uh, as I said, we've got a really interesting mix, frankly, of, of backgrounds and capabilities. Um, Liz Oakes, can I ask you to start with introductions and then we'll move to Janet and to Joel. Hi, James. Uh, thanks uh, for that. Yes. Uh, so I am responsible for um, strategy and operational excellence uh, across MasterCard uh, in the product and innovation area. And so that is a, a complex bag of uh, interesting different um, elements, it includes risk management, uh, how we manage our products and, and new product development, uh, how we also um, look at uh, areas like cross-border uh, strategy. Uh, and, and I have a team of fantastic data scientists that support the group. Um, so it's, it, it's an all-encompassing uh, area, but it's actually mostly primarily focused at how do we develop and collaborate with customers and, and come up with things that are relevant for the regions, relevant for the different uh, product areas that sit within the MasterCard uh, umbrella. Excellent. So I think we'll be coming back uh, to Liz uh, momentarily in relation to some of those kind of regional differences as well. But maybe before then, Janet, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi. Good evening. Good morning and, and good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Dia yeah, from UOB. Take care of uh, group channels and digitalization. Um, so I, I'm the delivery channels, uh, cutting across uh, the different countries and serving UOB customers uh, across all the markets that we operate, largely in Asia Pacific. We are big in ASEAN, so whether it's consumers, SMEs, uh, businesses and institutions. Um, I think in my other role, uh, besides you know uh, being a delivery channel, I'm also uh, very much called to the bank's omni-channel strategy. So we try to make sure that we connect customers online, offline, and giving them full uh, availability of choices and accessibility whenever they want, whichever they want. Um, and I take care of customer experience as well. So from a from a end to end. Uh, touch point to touch point, customer journey perspective, we try to make sure that you know we, we do our very best in ensuring that every episode, every journey of our customers' uh, engagement with us is uh, given the best treatment and that we deliver the best experience. And then last but not least, uh, on my uh, role of uh, championing uh, collaboration with fintechs and uh, digital platforms and ecosystem partnerships, so a lot of which we're going to talk about tonight, uh, it's, it's really about you know uh, championing the innovation mindset and also championing partnerships so that we can together grow the bigger pie and serve our customers and the constituents better. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Janet. So already a lot of focus on, on partnerships there from, from MasterCard and UOB, which, which brings us nicely to Joel. Joel, Rapid. Hi, so I'm Joel Yarbrough. I manage the Asia Pacific region for Rapid. Uh, we are what we call a fintech as a service platform. Uh, ultimately designed to make it easy for both small and large businesses to expand globally. 
uh, in a changing payments landscape, right? With different consumer preferences around collecting funds, dispersing money, holding money, converting foreign exchange. There's a lot for anyone to do as they globalize their business or regionalize their business. Rapid provides the single API platform to make that process of going hyper-local anywhere in the world much, much easier. So ultimately, I'm um, hopefully a simplification artist uh, as we build partnerships to make that happen around the world. A simplification artist. Wow. Okay, that's a new one. That that could be a new addition to the to the LinkedIn profile. Joel sounds good. And looking we'll go forward on my, to. We'll go on my tombstone, Jane. <laughs> well, no time soon. Let's hope. Um, lots to discuss. I, I mean, a lot of different angles we can take on this. I, I was thinking with Liz, uh, based out of the based out of the UK, Liz. I think you know your own background. Obviously, a tremendous amount of uh, experience, um, both with Mastercard and prior to that. When we think about MasterCard, I think it's very well known business. You know, it's one of the few global networks in any capacity. What are some of the big trends, kind of globally, as you see it, in relation to kind of payment infrastructure? Um, you know, whether it's what MasterCard has traditionally done on on the card acceptance or or card p uh, side, let me say, whether it's instant payments, whether it's some of those other trends. Is there anything you can kind of talk us through from that kind of infrastructure layer level at a uh, at a global perspective? Thanks, James. Um, yeah, I think so. I would put things in in three buckets of kind of you know uh, build, enhance, and protect. And so we look at uh, you know what's going on in the in the kind of changing ecosystem. It's a rush to there's like a race to build things that are faster, safer, more secure, more convenient. And and so actually there's a a, a whole um, slew of implementations going on around the world of instant payments. Um, but at the same time, we're connecting. So it's about convenience for the end user. So it's actually more about, for us, it's about multi-rail. So multi-rail in the infrastructure uh, environment means for us that actually customers very much more have a choice about how they uh, seamlessly interconnect. And a lot of it is also cross-border potentially. Um, so this is a shift towards better data in the ecosystem. Uh, so how do we introduce things like ISO 20022 globally and, and how do we improve the speed? So 24-7 is essential now. And, and this is just, uh, you know, domestic kind of country by country, people are putting in those new infrastructures. Singapore was at the forefront of that alongside the UK. Uh, but we see now major markets, the US, you know, we're, we're busy building and, and defining out new, better ecosystems in the US. Um, P27 in the Nordics for me is kind of a standout, uh, uh, you know, exhibit in terms of what are we really trying to do? So it's multi-currency, multi-jurisdictional, it's standardization, it's uh, single infrastructure replacing nine infrastructures across that region, uh, but it's about harmonization and making it much easier for banks and fintechs and, and consumers to actually uh, enable, you know, how do we get access to all of this uh, cool technology? But I think as we do that, we're also unfortunately having to you know really focus on protecting the system and the day-to-day -day resilience so you know the resilience doesn't go away we're running 24 7 100 uh, percent uptime both on the cards infrastructure and also on the the non-card ach or tp infrastructure um and and that brings with it all the attendant cyber security risks uh the fraud challenges that we see uh, particularly you know in this last uh, year with covid Actually, there's been a huge uh, upswing in in fraud attempts and scams that consumers are are exposed to, um, and and so kind of trying to do all of those things simultaneously, uh, uplift the infrastructure, move to to real time, uh, and with things like card, you know, contactless has gone through the roof. Uh, adoption has been massive globally, um, and, and we have to focus on. Uh, SRC, uh, SCA in, in, in Europe, lots of acronyms, you know, mm -hmm. that are, uh, sound like they're really simple. Uh, when you dig into them, actually are a huge complexity, both for us, for the banks, for the fintechs, for the consumer, uh, changing experiences, but, but an effort to really uh, almost kind of expanding from the infrastructure layer out into the ecosystem to make things much more convenient, secure, accessible, and also we are really focusing, we're doubling down on financial inclusion. So at MasterCard, there's a massive drive and focus to actually bring in the additional kind of for us, uh, uh, another half a billion people into the financial inclusion agenda. Um, Excellent. Really to, to raise GDP, to raise people's access uh, to the digital ecosystem. 
So, so I mean, a lot, a lot to un unpack there. Um, I, I mean, all of which interesting in its in its own ways. I guess you mentioned kind of multi rail up front. I, I would say for most people, certainly outside of the industry, they will think of Mastercard as as you know the the the, the symbol on their on their credit card or debit card in in many markets. But multi rail includes, as you say, the kind of RTP, the real time um, bank to bank transfer infrastructure. I guess Vocalink is is a key component yep. of that. Can you talk us through a little bit about that side of the business, the kind of non-card side of the business, uh, and specifically, you mentioned the UK, I guess, with faster payments, Singapore with fast. How how do you see that market uh, evolving over the coming years, both in terms of domestic real-time payments, and then maybe onto your to your second point around cross-border and, and interconnectivity? Sure. So, so yeah, it, just to confirm, multi-rail for us means a lot of things, actually. Uh, it also includes blockchain. It includes a whole route. It, it's pretty much kind of oh, all the... Liz, cool we're, only, we're only five minutes in and we've someone's already mentioned blockchain. I I, I should have... I, I was hoping we'd get through 15 minutes without blockchain. But anyway, let's... I'm sorry it's to interrupt. Um, <laughs> but, it's, but it's really, you know, that, that is, you know, a, a data rail for us, so primarily more than anything else as well. Um, I, I think the... the, the the construct for us is, you know, th there's financial transactions and there's data. Um, many of the they converge in many places and they diverge in some places also. So, um, yeah, the, the multi-rail thing really for us is much more about choice. So it's about enabling uh, either, you know, at the front end, it may be a consumer, but actually consumers generally don't care about rails. And, and quite frankly, we probably shouldn't be telling them what the rails are anyway. I, don't, I think people would just want to consume a capability or they want to consume the ability to move money fast with all of the attendant data and the notifications and the you know, information that comes with it. So when we look at kind of, therefore, you know, what do we double down or concentrate on? Um, Real-time payments has, has really emerged over the last probably 10 years as uh, one of the major investment areas and infrastructure shifts around the world. Uh, so MasterCard acquired Vocalink, uh, I think it's about three years ago now, so it feels like a long time ago. Um, and, and that's been an enabler really in terms of uh, standing up, not just a kind of a software sale to another infrastructure peer company around the world, but, but managed services. So being able to lean in on kind of having a provider that actually really understands how to run supervised, regulated payment systems that are secure, resilient, uh, you know, that, that, that really make a meaningful difference to an entire economy. And I think that's something that uh, specifically in Asia, you know, we're in the midst of, of, of working with a number of economies uh, where it, it, it's a massive deal in terms of financial inclusion and access. It, it tends to also enable mobile banking or, or mobile services and, and for many people who are not even banked, it's out to fintechs. It's you know, Joel would tell you, it's, it's kind of really enhancing the entire ecosystem. Excellent. Well, well, maybe that's a good uh, a segue or transition uh, to Janet. I mean, a again, we've, we've spoken about um, some of the new additional rails. I think Singapore has been, you know, really quite progressive in terms of building some of that underlying infrastructure. You know, Fast has been around for for many years. PayNow has been developed on that. I think SG Findex is a, a range of announcements coming out of um, coming out of the festival. But interestingly, Liz, I think you made the point, which is you know most people don't care about rails, and I think it's true, right? As a consumer uh, or a, as a business, infrastructure is typically something that exists in the background. And I think Janet, you know, we've spoken about your focus is very much on the customer um, in terms of that customer experience across channels. Can, can you speak to I guess how do, how does UOB uh, see the evolving landscape in Singapore or in in APAC generally um, from an infrastructure perspective? And then more specifically, how do you focus on the customer in terms of delivering upon that? Yes, I, I was going to say, you know, uh, perfect that you put, you know, Liz and me back to back because between UOB and MasterCard, we've done, just to give a call out, call out to, to MasterCard, when we first did our UOB Mighty, MasterCard and UOB was the first to tokenize, to have the card, you know, in, in the app. And mm. then also contactless, right, uh, for the ATM contactless. So so with MasterCard, we were able to charge up. I mean, Liz said, you know, build, enhance, protect, but it's also about, you know, being able to serve our customers a lot better, right? So I, I just wanted to, to thank uh, 
uh, you know, that, that great collaboration uh, with, with MasterCard. Now, I, I think, you know, I just want to say, you know, James, I would be, you know, uh, not truthful if I don't tell you that you know, the whole concept of open ecosystem and open banking, you know, in the first instance, you know, for, for a bank like us, you know, we are a bit more circumspect, right? But when we look at it, uh, the take that we take all the time is that open innovation is really about giving value to the customers. And if we're able to build better products, better services, and that we can ensure that the customer's needs are being addressed. I think then that's the way we have addressed, you know, the the, the likes of uh, the changes and the uh, promotion that MES has done. I was going to say two things, right? Liz and I, we were chatting before you joined the call just now about 2017 when they did a paper about API marketplace and all these uh, announcements that Ravi Menon, uh, MAS, made today. Uh, and he said, you know, pervasive electronic payment systems, affordable cross border remittances. So right now we have uh, PayNow and PromPay, Singapore yeah. and Thailand, right, to go live next year. Uh, and, and UOB is taking part, you know, in, in that. Uh, uh, for, for going live next year. And then, of course, the part we talk about holistic financial planning, the uh, SG Findex. All these were in the discussion and in the making, but at the end of the day, for why, for who, and for what. And I think this is the part that, you know, we, we constantly focus on. Um, on the individuals, the business, and the corporation front, maybe I'll just touch on each point and do this quite quickly. Sure. I think it is quite clear that from a UOB perspective, we take partnerships very, very seriously. And in fact, we do uh, a lot to promote partnerships so that together, you know, banking is very much a horizontal and a vertical. When we enable, you know, industries, when we enable e-commerce, when we enable right hailing, when we enable customers to, you know, uh, order food, particularly in the in the uh, COVID, you know, infested period, I think it empowers the uh, individual and the business to continue life and be able to do things uh, despite what could be obstacles. And I think this is the part that you know we have done in the last two years, even beyond COVID, to think through how can we make things easier. For, for us to serve our corporates, we look at the API and we say, so you will be, we we're more circumspect. We didn't kind of do a total open uh, API marketplace. We looked at what was the most sought after, the most sought after APIs that you know our customers tell us is really about account services, payments, collections, getting notifications when you receive money, when you pay out and you reconcile. It then enables the business, small or big, to be able to connect real time and share data, and then you know manage and run their business more efficiently. And I think for for that, you know, when we went live, you know, we saw a huge amount of take up. Of course, you know, bigger names like Grab. M1, you know, they were on it already with us as partners. But but that was also the thinking behind how we look at uh, empowering and building, you know, open ecosystems. Because from here, we can then put on the next set of, uh, you know, important and sought after APIs that adds the most value uh, to our customers, right? Uh, the second point, you know, around, you know, the, the individual. So we think about businesses, we think about individuals. Um, we, we know that right now with, uh, with pay now, Right. I mean, we talked about this um, a lot of our customers. I mean, within UOB, we know our customers set very well. We do have a good mix of the very young, the millennial, the, the, the savvy, you know, people like you, James, who yeah. you do make devices and, and tell us thank, every thank, single Thank day. you for calling me young, Janet. I appreciate that very much. Young at heart, young at mind, young at attitude, <laughs> you know. Yeah. My, my and, kids are aging me by the day, but I'm still somewhat young. I'm sure okay, she was calling you. you savvy, James. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But but then, you know, at UOB, we do have customers that, you know, we don't want to have the digital divide, nor the financial, you know, uh, excluded, right? So I think on that part, we ensure that from a omni-channel perspective, when we introduce, you know, things like PayNow, we also continue to have the ability to educate, right? How how does PayNow work? How does it, how is it safe? How do you use, you know, phone number and phone number? And then, you know, throughout the whole journey of mapping, what is the best a user experience in order that we can deliver, you know, whether uh, fast, pay now, and then right now, even with SG Findex, now that we can see, right, now that we can see and the banks taking part, we can let our customers view 
their balances in terms of uh, account services, you know, their uh, credit card balances, you know, the loan position, the unit trust and some of the wealth at one look. Knowing information is just the first step, right? That is just the first step. You need to then be able to help them uh, to get to the highest step, which is the know-how. After you know the information, what are you going to do about it? So, so this part about weaving in the right financial advice is also what you know we, we talk a lot about you know in, in, in UOB because the online, offline, the human, digital has to come together. And yep. then we can bring people to a better place and then help them plan for the better future. So, so I think you know if you if you marry this um, right now, because of customer experience, we use a, a metric called NPS, Net Promoter Score, to kind of understand you know what do people really look for and what is important for them. And we realized that during this whole pandemic, customers are all seeking value. They all want you know to be able to get value in in. in in addition to convenience, accessibility, safety, you know, and, and all that trust, they want to be able to get maximum value out of, you know, uh, banking and out of their business and out of their finances. So I think, you know, that's also where uh, the last few, um, you know, partnerships that we have built in, in promoting open ecosystem is about, you know, letting customers enjoy value, letting them be able to enjoy their rewards across a whole spectrum spectrum of uh, of uh, uh, different you know verticals whether you can use your reward points for uh, taking a meal uh, right now we can't travel but soon we can we can consume the sg hundred dollars voucher and in, in doing mm -hmm. local tours right uh, and, and so on and so forth so in doing so we can bring on board different partners that yep. together serve our customers better and, oh, and that you. i think is how we look at it I, thank you, Jenna. I think that's a, a lot of very interesting aspects to that. I mean, I think a couple of things as you were speaking that occurred to me is, I mean, how we think about, you know, the word open in open ecosystems or open banking or open APIs itself has many different meanings, right? Depending on the market you're operating in. In the UK, open banking is a very different construct than it is in Singapore or here in Hong Kong, in Australia, the consumer data right, et cetera. So, there, there is a kind of a, a level of openness. There's a the regulatory lens through which you can view it. There's a commercial lens, but it is it's clearly a, a kind of a macro global trend that we're seeing more and more kind of let's call it API enabled consumer driven connectivity across different service providers. Uh, the degree to which that's driven by government, the degree to which it's driven by the market, et cetera, may vary. Uh, but certainly we're seeing that trend. And I think that that kind of maybe segues quite nicely in, in, into Joel. Um, although maybe before we get into that, I think I'm conscious that we have a very international audience. So uh, SG Findex, which was referred to by Janet and just announced this week, is effectively a kind of account aggregation or, or an account inside aggregation service. And what's interesting there is it's it's effectively provided um, or, or I should say the infrastructure is provided um, through kind of Singaporean um, utilities, SingPass, um, you know, sitting on top of Fast and PayNow. And again, quite an interesting model to have a kind of government infrastructure, the banks, fintechs and others uh, operate on that. Um, and maybe, Joel, that is a good kind of uh, hopefully a tee up for yourself in terms of, you know, we, we've got we've got. You know, UOB, one of the biggest banks in the market here in Singapore or, or in Singapore. We've got, um, you know, MasterCard, obviously one of the, the big global networks. Uh, at the risk of us all agreeing on everything, I'm hoping you can bring a, a kind of a, a fintech as a service. I mean, wh where where is the disruption coming from? Is it is it coming from new players? Uh, how do you seek to empower them? Uh, how do you see all of this working in terms of the various kind of competing interests? And, and I guess, Fundamentally, where does rapid play in that in that uh, in that schema? Sure. Uh, I mean, at the risk of agreeing that everyone's agreeing, I mean, Liz and Janet laid out a framework where payments need to be fast, they need to be secure. Uh, Liz mentioned transparency, right? I want to know where my money is at a varying points in time. Uh, but she also touched on something fairly important, which is invisibility, right? Most people really don't want to think much about payments; they barely are comfortable thinking about money. So to a very large extent, they want it to be fading into the background of a task that they actually want to do uh, and to appear in a relevant way, in a relevant use case, which really creates a huge opportunity for companies like Grab, which Janet mentioned, large ecosystem players like Google, 
uh, with the various GPay announcements, et cetera, to start to bring together threads of things into people's daily lives, right? So I think we're going into a world where people that have very strong access to consumers' time uh, end up having larger and larger uh, ecosystems that bring in aspects of their money as well. Whether they have credit capabilities or not, they have transaction capabilities or data capabilities, all start to come together in seamless ways. Uh, you don't have to believe that a customer wants to go turn on a bunch of open banking connections to think they want to be able to purchase something online and not bounce, you know, bounce an overdraft, et cetera, and to have enough money and to get maximum value, or as Janet said, to use their points in an intelligent way. Making all those connections happen in one geography with a relevant set of APIs that are easy for an ecosystem player to get access to is pretty hard. Doing it in eight countries or 20 countries or 100 countries is almost impossible at the same time as they're trying to do their day job. So what we're trying to do at Rapid uh, is really to leverage a lot of these great investments, some of which, as you said, are governments, some of which are consortia, some of which are individually from a bank perspective, and provide a seamless layer so someone can integrate to a platform layer like ourselves or one of our very few competitors uh, and bring together an experience where they can create customers in a compliant and intelligent manner, a managing risk, they can bring funds into the system. They can collect money if that's how they think about the world. They can hold funds in a compliant manner and they can disperse funds or they can perhaps even issue a traditional card product. And, you know, going back to shout outs to MasterCard, you know, we're a MasterCard issuer and a direct acquirer in Europe as well. So we see a world where they have this ex very large expansion of networks, uh, some of which are you know, fully government owned or legacy networks that have matured some of which are basically proprietary, you know, semi, semi open loop networks uh, built on top of commercial rails, all of which start to mix and match using a variety of standards. Uh, and that's just a concophony for people to try to figure out. We fundamentally believe that platforms like ourselves are about simplifying that cacophony so people can focus on the needs of their customers and build use cases that are relevant for their customers. So, so okay, re re really interesting. I think for me, it raises um, some of the when I see open ecosystems, and I guess you know, not not to sound too much like a consultant here, but I guess this kind of industry convergence piece or, or kind of fintech everywhere idea um, has actually been quite real, at least for us in the region these past couple of years. I would say that you know, my amongst my biggest clients of the past kind of twenty four months have been you know a very large, well, a, a pan Asian retailer. A, an airline, a transport network operator, a travel service provider, a lot of folks who are have have either online or offline points of um, user concentration, right? Customers uh, to whom they are increasingly thinking, how do we integrate financial services, be it payments, perhaps microcredit, we're even looking at kind of mass wealth management solutions. Is this kind of industry convergence lens Something that's equally applicable across across the um, across the the landscape. What I mean by that is, will we see more? Um, I mean, you know, just this week or or last week, Singapore obviously has announced um, a number of new digital bank licenses. We've got a, a ride-hailing uh, telco joint venture. We've got an e-commerce um, service provider. I guess the question, and whoever wants to take this one, is, you know. Will we see more and more financial services subsumed into other um, other points of concentration? Will that come about through partnership? Will it come about through um, joint ventures? Uh, is this all just more competition? Uh, you know, who wants to make a kind of a guess in terms of how we will be conducting our day-to-day uh, -day financial services in five years' time? <laughs> Um, I'm happy to start with that one. Uh, I think if you take a step back and look at the macro of where are we in terms of economic development, we are clearly at the uh, beginning of a cycle. And, and there's you know a lot of uh, macroeconomic uh, commentators will tell you that kind of between now and 2030 is a period of expansion, more competition, more evolution and, and, and rapid development. And so uh, when you look at that standpoint, um, actually, there's huge opportunity for people like Joel, uh, for, for people like Rapid to, to manage that complexity as people try to enter into the market or participate in the market. Because if I look at it from the standpoint of a retailer or a merchant right now, you're faced with a, a very difficult trading uh, ecosystem. You've got um, people increasingly going digital, remote, um, but also 
just the sheer complexity of um, payments and, and getting paid. And I think getting paid for me is the most critical point, part of this. So as we expand all the options and we introduce more competition and we have new players, those people who are just trying to make a living selling something are faced with a huge level of complexity. You've got new banks coming into the ecosystem, new fintech players. For each of those, they have additional products. And so that means that a, a merchant is faced with, how do I actually accept those transactions? Uh, you've got crypto, you've got all sorts of new ways to pay in terms of loyalty. Um, so actually, at the same time, they have infrastructure requirements. They have to upgrade their point of sale or upgrade their, their way of getting paid integrate into new systems and at the same time probably you know upgrade their accounting ledgers uh, and how they interact with their supply chain so the just the sheer volume of complexity that's involved in that i think uh, provides huge amount of opportunity for people to streamline to help them um, and to navigate and to try and make intelligent choices i'm sure james you know i, I too have been a consultant that, trying to explain to somebody that yet again for the third time in 3 years or 5 years they have to change all of their systems that are you know customer facing is a very difficult investment decision to make um and and it's a you know but the the thing is we're inflicting this on every single merchant out there um that that's not funny uh, and and i think it's something sometimes we underestimate that we complain about the pace of change in our industry, but we are interconnected to every other industry and we're inflicting change on them at a great pace. And quite honestly, payments is not their day job. They just literally want to do their day job, but they'd like to get paid. And so I think sometimes we need to put that in context. Liz, I really, I really like that description of it, and and I'm I'm making note of it. I, I, to summarize your first point for me, like the increased complexity provides more opportunities to simplify, and and I really like that encapsulation of it. Um, Joel, Janet, any any comments in terms of where 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 we're headed over the next few years? Anything we should be really focusing on? I I, I was going to jump in on you know some things that we have never. You you said that. Uh, Liz mentioned blockchain in the first, you know, uh, I don't know, five or ten minutes. I think we didn't mention the word data or AI, you know, at all. You know, actually what uh, open ecosystem is really about. And for it to thrive, any ecosystem, right, Jane, think about it. Any ecosystem for it to thrive, it has to grow. It means that, you know, whether new players coming in, existing players, you know, growing, and and all of us, you know, coming into the mix uh, for, for the businesses, for the individuals, but also don't forget, we also have a community that we serve, right? So I think when when we think about that, I was going to take two points uh, again on the data part. In in wanting to promote the openness, in being able to want to serve better, right, is, is to increase our understanding of what the individual need of a single business or a single customer want. Uh, needs to do in the diff diff different life cycle or different life stage, right? And we know that it is complex because some people at certain life stage needs to save more and spend less, and some at the other life stage can afford to spend more and save less, right? And maybe invest, whichever the case would be. And similarly for business today, particularly if you think of how global the world has become, most of the businesses today are trying to look for better means of winning you know, more customers, winning more markets. And when they win customers and markets, they want to go for innovation to come up with better products and services. So this part about data, right? This part about data that collectively, if we as an ecosystem, you know, have can find a way that is safe that is fair, that's ethical, that's transparent, right? To be able to share that in the interest of the end user that we serve. So yep. that actively, right, as an ecosystem, whether we as a bank, you know, working with e-commerce or, you know, uh, real estate or, or, or shopping malls, right? Uh, or any of the other companies, utility firms, telcos, and so on and so forth, to better serve our end customer, we can find really, you know, that holy grail of being able to personalize, tailor, and provide, you know, the best uh, recommendation in the interest of that customer during that stage. And I, I think I, that as an ecosystem, we would have succeeded, right? It, it, and it's complex, but I'm, I'm just saying that it is, nothing is impossible. If we, if we think through uh, partnerships that are like-minded and can be trusted, but 
here is where I put a guard. That is the, the other thing, which is a guard. It, it is really about making sure that we don't, you know, uh, go overboard yeah. and do it too fast, such that, you know, safety, security, and, and cyber and all that, you know, bad things that could happen when things go wrong, um, you know, threaten and and un unravel, you know, all the good work that has been done. And I, I think, think that's a really good point, John. Yeah, yeah. regulators, partners, we can all come together and, and be uh, more thoughtful about how we can, you know, keep the customer safe while we champion innovation. I, I think it's a great point. And, and I would add, in addition to the kind of technical considerations around security, safety, et cetera. There's also going to be quite a lot of customer expectation management here because, you know, I, I do believe that hyper-personalization may actually see some pushback from consumers, right? As they realize that actually they're not necessarily comfortable with this with this kind of vast kind of data store being, uh, of course, as we all uh, know here, transaction data, payment payment data is already incredibly powerful and, and in some cases underutilized. Um, very conscious of time, Joel. Uh, we're we're coming to the end, so so that 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 leaves last uh, thoughts with you, my friend. You know, what should we all be thinking about over the next five or ten years? So uh, I think where Janet and Liz were going is right. The system is extremely powerful. These strings have to be brought together. Uh, AI and personalization can make the experience hyper hyper relevant to an individual user. Uh, and then the caution I would throw in for most of the people paying for this conference is the people who have the data, who have the personalization capabilities, and have the distribution power is a very small number of platforms that are going to outrun most of the people here unless people learn to compete at a higher level. Oh, what a great way to leave it. Okay, excellent. Um, on that note, and I think let's to be continued, hopefully in person uh, in Singapore next year, uh, please join me in thanking Liz, Janet, and Joel. Thank you for joining us. Looking forward to it. Thanks, James. Thank you. James, absolutely splendid stuff. Yes, I agree. I hope we will be, all be meeting in person this time next year. And well done. Your kids stayed asleep throughout the panel. Well, a big thank you to all of them.